It's my privilege to introduce uh, this week's CFA colloquium speaker, Eve Lee. So Eve is uh, visiting us from Caltech, where she is the uh, Sherman Fairchild uh, postdoc in theoretical physics. So she is a theorist, as the as the postdoc name suggests. She did her PhD with Eugene Chang at the Berkeley before uh, coming to Caltech, and she will move on from Caltech to. Uh, a faculty position at McGill uh, next year so as an assistant professor. And uh, please take the way, teach us about planet formation. Great. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. Um, it's always very refreshing to be back on the East Coast. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do planets form? Um, if there's one thing that we've learned from the Kepler spacecraft is that planets are extremely common. And it's not just any planets, but the planets that are larger than the Earth, but smaller than Neptune, those that we call as the super-Earths. So in this lay of the land of exoplanets, as detected by Kepler, where I'm plotting the radius versus orbital periods with darker colors corresponding to more number of planets. And just for your reference, uh, these are the inner solar system terrestrial planets. And immediately you see that uh, most of the planets out there outside of, their solar, outside of our solar system look nothing like this solar system planets. Not only are they puffier, but they're also much closer in to the host stars. So it's this clump over here are the super-Earths found in about 30 to 50 percent of all sun-like stars. So if you want to answer the question of how do planets <laughs> form, we better start by tackling that question by looking at the norm, these ordinary planets, before we have a chance at investigating the exceptions. So we'll, for the next 50 minutes or so, we're going to investigate the formation of these super-Earths, these normal, ordinary types of planets, by looking at the distribution of their measured radii, masses, and their orbital periods to get a sense of where, when, and how the planets have formed. Here's measured radii versus measured masses of these super-Earths. They typically have masses of about 1 to 20 Earth masses and radii between 1 and 4 radii. It's a rather large scatter, but typically to explain both their radii and masses, they must have some gaseous envelope on top. In particular, they need a few percent by mass envelope. So gas to core mass ratio of about 1 to 100, that means these planets are rather gas poor. And if you want to form gas poor objects, it's natural to think of their formation environment to be a gas poor environment. So how does that fit in in terms of the evolution of the disk, the evolution of their natal environments? Planets form in disks, disks of gas and dust. And during the early stages, these protoplanetary disks are rich in both gas and solids. But over time, the disk gets blown away on the outskirts by the photoevaporation of the host star. And in the inner regions, those gas gets accreted onto the star. So that over a million year time scale, the disk gas all gets dissipated away so that the disk becomes gas poor and therefore solid rich. <coughs> So it is likely that these super-Earths assemble late in this gas-poor environments. This ensures that they emerge with low gas-to-core mass ratio to explain both their radii and masses. This also helps them to not undergo large-scale migration. And I'll discuss uh, later on why the observations tells us that this in-situ formation scenario is more favored. And furthermore, there's a physical reason why we might expect this late-time assembly of these planets. And that's because if you want to form this planetary cores by major mergers, in other words, giant impacts, then those giant impacts actually require a gas-poor environment. So when it comes to giant impact, gas actually becomes your enemy. Gas tends to damp away the eccentricities of these rocky bodies. And once you have a system of circular orbits, you're not going to have mergers. You need to get rid of the gas so that the gravitational stirring between those bodies can pump each other's eccentricities to allow the orbits to cross and allow the cores to merge. 
So just like dark matter halo merger trees in galactic astronomy, we can also build a core merger trees in exoplanets. So here's a cartoon diagram of how that might look like in the context of the disk gas evolution. So in the early stages, you have some systems of uh, many small rocky bodies. And as the disk gas gets dissipated away, they undergo this multiple series of um, two by two giant impacts to finally emerge as the final planetary core in the gas poor, the late stage of the disk evolution. And the plot over here is the actual end body calculation of this merger trees as computed by Becky Dawson. So core assembly requires a gas poor environment, but just how depleted does the disk need to be of the gas? Can we quantify that? And the answer is that you can. So how you do it? You simply balance the core merger time scale to the eccentricity damping time scale by the gas dynamical friction. And when you consider the merger time scale, it's exponentially sensitive to how far apart the smaller protocores are in units of mutual heat radii. So you, you, so you need to know what the previous spacings of these planets were before this uh, final planetary systems that we see with the Kepler <laughs> spacecraft. So thankfully, we have some measure of the present day Kepler planet orbital spacings. It's about 14 mutual heat radii. So then you can back out what the previous spacing was. And in the range of sort of one sigma error bar, it's anywhere between seven and 11 mutual heat radii. So this plot here is showing the required level of density depletion on the right and the corresponding solid to gas mass ratio on the left. So if you want to form this mergers for the then what you need is, at minimum, you need to deplete the gas by about four orders of magnitude with respect to the minimum mass extrasolar nebula, which, by the way, is pretty much a minimum mass solar nebula. They only differ by a factor of five. So you need to deplete the gas by four orders of magnitude with respect to the typical solar value. And another interesting thing is this level of depletion is actually just what's required to allow this course to not undergo large-scale migration. In other words, if you just calculate the typical migration time scale due to the torque between the planet and the gas, this time scale for this really gas-poor environment is going to be longer than a million years, the typical uh, lifetime of the gas disk. Okay, so we need density depletion by four orders of magnitude. That's some impressive level of density depletion. And these super Earths, they still have some gaseous envelope on top. So can you build this few percent by mass envelope in this extremely gas poor environment? To answer that, we need to understand the physics of gas accretion, which for the small planets, they really just boil down to the physics of cooling. So the heuristic idea is that if you have a rock sitting in the gaseous nebula, then any gas within its hill sphere will be bound to the core and become an envelope. And that envelope is going to cool and contract over time, which leaves some empty room for the ambient gas to refill. So the time scale of accretion is set by the time scale of cooling. So in order to actually build this time evolution of the super Earth atmospheres, you can build a series of hydrostatic snapshots, each corresponding to different envelope mass fraction, and then you simply calculate the time it takes to go from one snapshot to the next. Each hydrostatic snapshot is simply a solution to your favorite stellar structure, equa uh, stellar structure equations, where the difference here is that there is some rocky core at the bottom, and this is not an isolated object. They actually connect smoothly to the disk. So this is the um, example envelope structures, so how envelope looks like for this individual hydrostatic snapshots. And one thing to note here is we built our own equation of state to make sure that we capture the physics of hydrogen molecule dissociation, which turns out to be a really important physics when it comes to the thermodynamics of these planetary atmospheres. But going back to the original question of, can you build a few percent biomass envelope in this extremely gas-poor environment? 
So let's test that by looking at the envelope mass fraction as a function of time. And we're going to see what happens to this final value as we deplete the ambient gas further and further. So this line is two orders of magnitude depletion with respect to the typical solar value at 0.1 AU. Let's deplete that by one more order of magnitude. There's very little change here. Two more orders of magnitude, still very little change. And even if you choose something crazy, like seven orders of magnitude depletion, you still get a few percent by mass envelope. So the rate at which these planets accrete their gas is remarkably insensitive to this boundary conditions, the conditions of the protoplanetary disk. So why is that case? Remember how these cores accrete as much gas as they can cool. So we need to understand the actual thermal structures of these planetary atmospheres. And in general, they come in two layers. You have inner convective zone and an outer radiative layer. <coughs> Most of the mass and therefore energy is within this convective zone. So, so the rate at which the energy transports out is, is regulated by how much energy that you can transport out of this convective layer, which is simply set by the thermodynamic properties of this radiative convective boundary. So the way to think about this is um, at the end of the day, the radiative uh, energy transport is set by the local temperature gradient. By definition, that temperature gradient is maximized at the radiative convective boundary. So that boundary acts as a thermal bottleneck. It basically acts as a limiting factor in terms of how much energy can transport out of this convective layer into the radiative layer. So where does this boundary occur? Turns out, it almost always occurs at this H2 dissociation front. So once you have this dissociated free hydrogen atoms, they can combine with the free electrons, <laughs> the valence electrons that got freed off of uh, the heavier metals, then you form the H minus ions. And it's the bound free transition of those H minus ions that become the dominant source of opacity for these atmospheres um, at this radiative convective boundary. And on the inside, the, because the H minus opacity is such a strong function of temperature, you have the surge of opacity, which ensures that convection prevails. So the emergence of this radiative convective boundary is simply set by the quantum mechanics of hydrogen molecule dissociation and the production of H minus ions, which doesn't really care about whatever happens on the outside. So that is why the final atmospheric mass is so weakly sensitive to the disk gas density. Now, what about the remaining time scale of the gas disk? Um, so, so far, I've shown you the calculations assuming that the core has a million year to accrete their gas. But what if those cores form so late that you have even less than a million year to accrete their gas? And luckily, even if you go down to sort of 10,000 years, you can still build a few percent by mass envelope. And that's because the envelope mass grows slowly as a function of time. It grows as time to the 0.4 power so that the remaining disk lifetime can be as short as 10,000 years and as long as a million years. <coughs> So the rate of uh, gas accretion is, is robust against this different uh, depletion history of these late time stages of the disk. So where does the scaling come from? All the cooling physics that I told you thus far, you can actually calculate it with just your pen and paper. So I'll just go through some simple steps uh, that you can actually do on the back of your envelope. So the first thing to notice is the Accretion time scale is set by the cooling time scale, which is just energy divided by luminosity. This energy is simply the, uh, the atmosphere sitting in the potential of the core, so it, so it scales linearly with the gas mass, and the luminosity is set by the radiative diffusion at the radiative convective boundary, which of course scales as the photon mean free path, so it's going to scale inversely with the gas mass. If you combine all of these, then time grows as mass uh, the gas mass to squared, flip it, gas mass grows as time to the 0.5 power. 
But before, I told you it grows as 0.4 um, power. So where does that come from? Well, you actually have to go through all the nitty-gritty detail calculation. And if you do that, then you can derive the full scaling relationship between the gas mass fraction to the, not only the time, but also the metallicity and the core mass. And this is what you get at the end of the day. If you plug in the right number, then you're going to uh, get the 0.4 power. And this plot is here just to demonstrate to you this good agreement between the theory, the analytic theory, which is in red dashed line, versus the numerical model, which is in solid line. So putting this back to the context of the disk evolution, the evolution of the uh, natal environment of these planets, I've said that the super-Earths likely form in the late stages of disk evolution in this gas-poor environment um, that are short-lived. And that's reminiscent of transitional disks, where it may be that the super-Earths form in the inner cavities of these transitional disks, which are short-lived. And the robustness of this uh, gaining of few percent by mass envelope onto the different degrees of density depletion and also the remaining disk lifetime may be the reason why these planets are so common. So we've discussed about the radii and mass distribution of these super-Earths. Now let's consider their orbital period distribution to see where and how these planets have formed. This is the observed occurrence rate profile, so number of planets per star as a function of orbital period. This corrects for all the false positives and also the detection, uh, the detection limits. And different colors here correspond to the different data sets. The red are the M dwarfs. Um, disclaimer, those are early M dwarfs. The blacks are the F2K dwarfs. The blues are the ultra short period planets around GK dwarfs. Ultra short period means orbital period less than one day. So just looking at this, what was really remarkable to me is the consistency of this shape as a function of stellar spectral type. Also, they all have a break at around 10 days and a similar sloped fall off towards a shorter orbital period. So what is causing that? I'll start by giving you the answer. And the answer is that the number of planets fall off here because disks have holes. And by holes here, I'm not just talking about the cavity holes of the transitional disks. I'm talking about the actual, the actual innermost cavity of this protoplanetary disk. <clears throat> Unfortunately, we can't really resolve those inner holes. We're talking about periods of less than 10 days. But what we can do is to use stellar rotation periods as proxies. And the idea there comes from the idea of the magnetospheric uh, truncation. So during the early stages, when the host star is still on pre-main sequence stage, they are much more magnetic than what we currently observe. And their magnetic field lines are going to thread through the disk and impart magnetic stress force, which pushes the gas away from the star. At the same time, we actually detect accretion of this disk gas. So there's a rain pressure from just the motion of that accretion. And where these two forces balance is where we expect to see the truncation, inside which we expect to see a funnel flow of the gas onto the star following the magnetic field lines. So in this geometry, there is an angular momentum transfer between the spin of the star and the orbital motion of the disk, so that at equilibrium, we would expect this truncation to approach the co-rotation radius with respect to the star. For example, if initially the disk truncated inside of the corrotation, then this gas over here has higher specific angular momentum so that the gas will fall onto the star while the star spins up. That would push this corrotation closer in towards that initial truncation. In the opposite scenario, where you had the truncation outside of the corrotation, then now the star has higher specific angular momentum, so the gas gets propelled away while the star spins <coughs> down. And again, they would push this quotation away from the star approaching the initial truncation. 
there's actually an observational evidence of truncation near quotation given by the dipper stars that Ryan has mentioned uh, during the luncheon. And these are young stars that are characterized by those irregular dips in their light curves. And in particular, those irregular dips coincide with the periodicity of what's caused by the star spots. Basically, they have the same period as the spin of the star. So whatever is causing these dipper dips um, could be those entrained <coughs> dust material. They are rotating at, they are rotating with the star, so that the truncation of the inner edge of the disk would be near the core rotation. So if we go out there and look for the measured rotation periods of these stars in young star clusters, then what we see is that the number of those stars peak at around 10 days and falls off at shorter rotation periods. Just like in the planet occurrence rate profile, which breaks at around 10 days and falls off at shorter orbital periods. So the shape of the fall off here could just be due to the tracing of these planets that formed near the inner edges of their natal disks. So let's actually test that hypothesis by building a model ensemble of disks. So what we're doing here is for each and every planetary system, we're going to draw the innermost edge of those systems by drawing from the measured rotation periods of young star clusters. And we're going to distribute some number of planets anywhere between the inner edge of the disk out to about 400 days. How we distribute these planets depends on how we think these planets have formed. Did they form in situ or did they form somewhere far out and then migrated in. So let's be agnostic and just test both of those cases. The in situ scenario is really simple to implement. All we do is these planets are randomly distributed in log orbital period, which is consistent with the idea that these planets are separated by some number of mutual heat radii to ensure their orbital stability. Now in the case of this induced uh, large-scale migration, the classic expectation is that these planets should approach and lock into mean motion resonance, especially if the innermost planets have parked at the inner edge. However, in recent years, there have been a lot of studies that refute this classic idea, where depending on the mass ratios of these uh, migrating planets, as well as the disk properties, you may never have this locking into mean motion resonance, or you may actually drive the systems to orbital instability. So in that case, once you have all these planets that just kind of collect at the edge, they're likely going to undergo an orbital instability and therefore mergers. So three different flavors of outcome with two broad classes of model. Let's see which one does the best at fitting with the data. So jumping straight to the result, the line over here, the red line, is the model expectation compared against the data which are given by circles. The in situ model, like the data, plateaus a bit outside, breaks at around 10 days, and falls off at shorter orbital periods. Migration can also get the break and the fall off, but this fall off here is just not as steep as is required by the data. And this is expected out of migration because this is what migration does. It simply transports the planet from far out and just pile them up at the edges of the disk, which is the reason why the, this fall off here is, is, is which, which is why you have this increased excess of the planet with respect to the data and also the in situ model. So in situ model seems to do better at agreeing with the data. But even in, even in this better agreeing model, there's a problem here that we're not getting any of this ultra short period planets. So how did these planets get so close in to their host stars? And the answer lies in tides. As the host star evolves off to the main sequence, they're going to spin down. And that means this bulge that's been raised by the tides raised on the star by the planet is going to lag behind the planet and just pull on the planet. This planet is going to undergo an orbital decay, 
until it gets destroyed either at the Roche lobe radius or at the surface of the star. And just a reminder, for this small planet, the angular momentum of the stellar spin just completely dwarfs the orbital angular momentum of the planet that this star-planet configuration will never come into a synchronous state. So this planet is just going to continue to undergo orbital decay. So let's test whether the ultra-short period planets that we observe are simply these planets that are en route towards the star. So the black line here is calculation without tides. The colored lines are those with tides. And within the, within the sort of uh, typically quoted range of the tidal uh, dissipation factor, we do get the right number of the ultra-short period planets. So in fact, it appears to be that these planets have arrived that close to the star simply by this asynchronous tides being raised on the star. There are other evidence of the tidal decay. The first is that if you look at the orbital spacings between a pair of planets as a function of their orbital periods, there is an enhanced spacing inside of about one to two days. And this can be naturally explained by tides because it is a divergent migration. So you have a star, you have two planets, this planet that's closer into the star is going to undergo much faster orbital decay than this planet because it's a very strong function of the distance between the star and the planet. So it just naturally causes this uh, spreading of the orbits close into the star. And the circles here are the data compared against the model, which are in blue line. And you do get the right qualitative <coughs> agreement between the two. Another evidence is that we see lack of the ultra-short period planets around young stars. Um, this is the innermost orbital period versus time. This time actually comes from gyrochronology. So you can actually just translate this to the stellar rotation, the present day stellar rotation. And it's been known for a while that we don't see short period planets around faster rotators. So this also could be the result of tides, where again, the circles are the data compared against the tidal decay model, which are given in these dashed lines. We can make predictions for how the orbital period distribution will look like when we look at different types of stars. So we have the data for FGK and early M. What about other types of stars, like A stars, for example? Herbig A stars are much faster rotators compared to their Titori counterparts, probably because they have a much weaker magnetic field. So if you've been following what, uh, if you just follow the discussions that I've been giving thus far, where the inner edge of the protoplanetary disk is sculpted by the magnetospheric truncation as stellar corrotation, then we would expect to find the planets around A stars to be closer in compared to those around FGK and M. And it'll be really cool if we can actually detect and probe planets around this high mass stars. Um, there is a, also some hint of dynamic perturbation of this uh, close in planets. And this comes from a very recent result uh, given by Fei Dai at, uh, at MIT slash Princeton. Um, where if you look at the mutual inclination of these ultra-short period planets, they tend to appear much more flared up compared to those that are farther out. So this could be an evidence of some dynamic perturbation by an outer companion, and I think it's a very promising avenue to think of because recent results have shown that 40% of all super-Earth systems have a long-period gas giant companions. So to summarize, how to explain the shape of the orbital period distribution? Again, the lines here are the model compared against the data, which are in circles. Outside of this 10 days, where we see some plateau, those can be explained by planets that are formed in situ far from the disk edge. The fall off here between 10 days and a day, those can be explained by planets that have formed in situ, but at the disk edge, given by the magnetospheric truncation. And these ultra-short period planets, those can be explained by tidal in spiral. 
So this in situ formation scenario is completely consistent with the idea of the assembly of the super Earth during the late stages of disk evolution in the gas poor environment. And we've, and, uh, and we've discussed how in those gas poor environment, super Earths can robustly build a few percent by mass atmosphere. So that robustness, again, may be the reason why these planets are so common. And also the other way around, because these planets are so common, these sort of in situ late time formation scenario could be the common mode of planet formation. So we've talked at length about how these ordinary super Earth planets form. But now let's think about the exceptions. What about those planets that are larger? So here is again the planet occurrence rate as a function of orbital period but different colors correspond to the different size of planets. Um, unfortunately, um, like other fields of astronomy, exoplanets also suffers from some taxonomy. Um, but just think of the, this green and blue as planets smaller than fourth radii, and the yellow and red as planets uh, greater than fourth radii. And immediately, what really struck out at me is that they look so different from each other there's something special about this dividing line of four Earth radii. So, so this uh, plateau break and the fall off, uh, that can be explained by the in situ formation with the disk truncation at core rotation. But what's going on with this continuous rise of these large planets? So when I first saw this, I thought this could be an evidence of different formation mechanism. But what I found out in sort of, uh, sort of by accident is that you can actually explain this increasing the number fraction of planets by using the same formation mechanism of this uh, late time in situ formation. So before I move on, because I'm talking about late time formation, I'm not going to be talking about the, the gas giants. I'm only going to be talking about the planets that, are, that have sizes between 4 and 8 Earth radii. So what's so special about this fourth radii? Planet sizes are primarily determined by how much gas these planets have. So if you're talking about planets smaller than fourth radii, then they have envelope mass fraction less than 10%. If they are larger than fourth radii, then they have envelope mass fraction larger than 10%. So what is the requirement to accrete this larger than 10% by mass envelope? Sort of not surprisingly, large planets require more massive cores. Here is, again, the same um, gas accretion calculation by cooling with the different colors corresponding to different masses. And this, again, is in the context of this uh, late time uh, formation where the gas accretion time scale would range anywhere between uh, 10,000 years to about a million years. And if you want to create this four to eight Earth radii planets, you need to have massive planets on the order of 10 Earth masses. By contrast, if you want to create planets that are less than fourth radii, they don't really have this core mass requirement. You can create them with any of these planets with a wider range of core masses. So perhaps this continuous rise of this a number of large planets it's just simply a reflection of the, of the ease of creating these large planets as a function of orbital period. So let's think about that in the context of core assembly by dry and impact, this series of major mergers. You can actually calculate to order of magnitude what is the maximum mass of the core that you can create out of dry and impact by realizing that there is a sort of a feeding zone that's relevant for dry and impact where this cores, these cores are going to undergo radial scatter as they get perturbed by their neighboring bodies. And the maximum energy that, it can, that they can impart is basically given by the surface escape velocity of the neighboring bodies. So this radial scatter is simply given by the surface escape velocity divided by the Keplerian rotation frequency. So this maximum impact mass is simply the, 
the local surface density at that location times the area of this annulus. So what is this local surface density? You can fit that by assuming all the Kepler planets, or most of those Kepler planets, have formed by this series of giant impact. And what, and what you'll find is that the, surface, the solid surface density is going to grow, is going to scale with the orbital distance to the negative 2.2 power. The same exercise has been made by Hilke Schlichting in 2014, but what I'm doing here is I'm refitting to a much cleaner sample by the California Kepler survey. And I'm also using the mass radius relationship, given uh, the updated mass radius relationship from Angie Wolfgang, where I use that relation to, to translate the measured radii to the masses of these Kepler planets. So if you plug this back in, then what you'll find is that the, this maximum impact mass is going to scale as the orbital radius to 0.45 power. So in other words, you can create more massive cores farther from the star. So why is that the case? Well, farther out you go from the star, you are at the shallower um, part of the potential well of the star, so it's just a lot more easier to perturb those cores by the neighboring bodies. So they're going to undergo a larger radial scatter. So if you just plug all of that in, um, where, the, where all the physics here is simply the core formation by giant impact, as well as gas accretion by the cooling of the envelope, then, and in situ formation, then just, just those three simple physics will tell you, will give you this overall rise of the occurrence rate of these large planets, whereas for the small planets, you have a, a more, more of a plateau and maybe a hint of a decline as you go to larger orbital period. And just to remind you, this kink at 10 days and the fall off is simply a reflection of the distribution of the inner hole sizes as given by the stellar rotation period. Um, so I'll, I'll be honest that it's not a great quantitative uh, agreement here. But uh, there, there still needs to be more work uh, to be done. In particular, you also need to take into account the, um, the time scale at which you're going to undergo the giant impact, which will increase as you go farther out. However, the point here is that you can reproduce this general rise of the number of planets just because you can create uh, more easily this massive course farther out from the star. There are some predictions that can be made uh, using this uh, giant impact model. So the first is we expect a correlation between the core masses and metallicity, where you expect large cores around a more solid heavy disk, which probably can be probed by more metal-rich stars, which is not a surprise, but basically there is an exact correlation that we would expect from these kind of calculations. And I was rather pleased to find that for the known large planets, with, with well-measured masses and radii, they do seem to fit relatively well with the uh, model expectation. We also expect to find large planets uh, to be uh, more likely to appear around metal-rich systems. So if you look at the cumulative distribution function of the stellar metallicity uh, divided between those small planets versus large planets, where the solid line is the data, we do see this uh, relative shift of these large planets towards higher metallicity stars, as again would be expected from the model as given by the dashed lines. Okay, so all the calculation is based on this, on this calculation that if you want to create these large planets, you need to have core masses as large as about 10 Earth masses. And you go back to this plot and you notice right away that there are some planets, large planets with masses much smaller than 10 Earth masses. In particular, this planet over here has mass just as small as about 2 Earth masses. So what's going on with these, um, these planets? Um, these are sort of the exceptions of the exceptions. And these are the planets that I call as the super puffs. So how do we create these super puffs? Um, you 
cannot create them in this the same uh, late kind in situ formation scenario. So the, the goal here is to get to this blue bar to explain these, uh, these super puffs. What you have to do is not only do you have to go far out from the star, you also need to get rid of the dust in the upper envelope. And by getting rid of, what I'm really talking about is you need to remove them as the dominant source of opacity, which can be, which can be done by just simple coagulation and then settling. So if you form a dust-free world outside 2AU, then even this tiny 2 Earth mass core can successfully build a 30% by mass envelope and become a super puff. So why is that the case? Why do you need this, why do you need these requirements? So farther out from the star, the colder the disk gets, and when you do not have dust grains of, as the opacity source, what's important are the, the, are the gas molecules opacity, and farther out you go in the colder environments, the row vibrational modes tend to freeze out so that the planet becomes less opaque and when the planet becomes less opaque, they're more likely to cool. So that's a lot of words. And like any uh, physical concepts, they're much more easily understood if you just see them in action. So here's an experiment. Um, let's see if I can actually run this. Brought to you by a theorist. And let's see if it runs. OK, so what I'm doing here is this is a hot tea um, with the milk here using as a tracer of the convective motion. And what we are testing here is the ability of this boundary, the thermal boundary condition to reinvigorate this convection. In other words, its ability to control the rate of energy transport. So I'm just, I'm just waiting for the cream to settle down. Sorry, it's taking a while. Eventually, I'm going to place the metallic lid on top um, to more easily control the temperature there by using ice cubes. So that's one ice cube and two ice cubes. And you see the cream to rise back up. And I assure you, I didn't do anything else other than just putting ice cubes on top. And there you go. Convection got reinvigorated just by cooling off the top. So again, this accentuates, uh, this emphasizes this uh, importance of this boundary conditions, the boundary of the convective layer to control the rate of energy transport. Um, so just, uh, just quickly, so the super puffs, they have to form far out in these cold regions beyond 1 to 2 AU. But we currently see them at around 50 to 30 orbital uh, period, um, 30 to 50 days. So that means the super puffs must have undergone some large scale migration. And again, the classical expectation is that they are expected to be found in mean motion resonance. And that's exactly what we see for the systems where we know these super puffs to exist. Um, like Kepler-51, 223, this system has actually been confirmed to be in mean motion resonance, and all the other planets are still waiting to be confirmed. And contrast that with the typical Kepler systems, so the small planets, they are nowhere near resonance, so this is one of the reasons why uh, we would think that in-situ formation is the more favored um, model. So to summarize the formation of this uh, planets found by Kepler, going back to this occurrence rate profile, these small planets can be explained by the in situ formation during the late stages, and this fall off here can be explained by tracing of the planets that are formed near the edges of the disk. And we also saw some planets that will go off this, off this plot, the ultra short period planets, those can be explained by the tidal orbital decay. And what about these exception, exceptions, these large planets? Those can be explained by, the again, the in-situ formation, but around metal-rich systems. However, some of those planets, like the super puffs, they require a large-scale migration. 
So with the so Kepler has taught us a lot, but unfortunately it is coming near near the end of its lifetime. So what is the future for planet formation in the context of some upcoming and also ongoing missions? So of course this is not an exhaustive uh, remaining questions, but these are some things that uh, keep me up at night. Um, so just to share with you some of these, I would be really interested in figuring out the changes in the planet occurrence rate as a function of stellar spectral type. So I briefly showed you how the, how the shape doesn't change as you go from FGK to M, but the actual magnitude changes. So why is that the case? And also, will we see that continuous um, um, enhanced level of the planet occurrence rate as you go to even cooler type of stars? And that's going to be, uh, and TESS is going to be really helpful in getting a sense of the planet demographics as a function of a stellar spectral type, as well as some um, near infra infrared uh, radio, uh, radio velocity uh, spectrographs. And what about the time evolution of the planet properties? I briefly touched on how there seems to be this lack of ultra short period planets around the younger stars. But what about even younger stars, like those around, uh, to, like, like those around like young star clusters? And K2 has started uh, going into that direction. And again, TESS is going to be helpful um, just, just, by its, just by its nature of looking at the all sky. And what's really bugging me is that we have no sense of planet, right now, of planet demographics beyond 300 days. So we have a really good idea, thanks to Kepler, but uh, we basically, if you just plot this on the, if you just zoom out and look at the entire um, orbital period space, then there is a huge void of, like, just no detection of any planets below Jupiter masses beyond 300 days. Um, so actually probing those small planets, uh, we will have to wait for um, like W first and, and also 30 meter class telescopes, but it is, a, it is an important avenue to follow to really have a good overall understanding of planet formation um, across a wider range of orbital periods and, and also across a wider range of planet masses. And how does this all fit in with this amazing array of, of of images and results of the protoplanetary disks that we got from ALMA. For example, how are the solids distributed with respect to, for example, stellar spectral type? Would that help in understanding this first question of why does the planet occurrence rate change as a function of stellar spectral type? Um, so these are some of the remaining questions that I have in mind, and uh, thank you for your attention. migration time scales will be the shortest. So that suggests that the ones further out in the disk also aren't, I mean, it's even harder to, to get the disk to migrate things fast in the outer parts of the disk. But uh, and so that, that, does that suggest that most of these planets just don't exhibit migration at all? Uh, and then the other question is, is that all, since you suddenly, uh, the, these counterexamples like these super puffs that do show uh, very good evidence that they migrated. Uh, does that suggest that uh, there's a whole bunch of super puffs at larger periods that didn't experience that migration? Yeah, that's an interesting question. So, um, sort of to answer the case of super puffs, for example, um, because of their need for migration, and also the reason why, uh, the physical reason why I'm saying that most of these um, small planets do not undergo migration is because is consistent with within the context of the late time formation where the migration time scale just lengthens, you know, over a million year. So that's over the time scale where the disk gas will be around. So of course, if you want to want these planets to undergo some migration, they necessarily have to form early 
And that says something about the relative time scale of the super pot formation or the puppy planet formation versus the small planet, uh, versus, yeah, versus the smaller planets. And uh, getting the exact time scale right uh, is a challenge. I have a naive question about the, the time scales again. <coughs> Uh, when you're talking about stars like M type versus F type, the T Taurus stage uh, duration is different by like, two orders of magnitude. But you're giving some absolute values like 10 to the 60 years. So, what type does it correspond to, and how does it uh, change when you go up and down in the mass of a star? Um, so is your question the time scale of the disk or the time yeah, scale of the basically stellar? the proto proto star uh, the proto star stage it, like it's different the duration is different by two orders of magnitude mm -hmm. you go from like one to I don't know fifteen million years for low mass stars to like hundreds of thousands mm -hmm. and uh, today during the lunch and you met, uh, during the lunch talk you also mentioned that there is like time scale of a few a few million years for the for the formation. Does it apply only to solar type stars? Or does it apply to everything? I mean, uh, this is what I don't understand. Yeah. So those time scale uh, actually more typically correspond to like more solar type stars. But you're definitely right that around uh, cooler stars and lower stars will have more extended uh, time scale of the disk. Um, so that's actually interesting in the context of the question that I raised about why you have more planets around and dwarfs. Uh, for example, and that might tie in with the fact that uh, there is uh, the disks have a lot, the disks just stay around longer, yep. so you have a like, more chance of creating these planets. Yeah, I should just on that last point, actually, the, the, the data that's available suggests that the end dwarf disk disappear faster, but this is still being worked on. But you, my question with the end dwarfs was actually uh, sort of presaged by your previous question, uh, and that is that in terms of the pre-main sequence contraction, which is the spin-up which produces that high magnetic field that you use for the disk truncation, this happens on a time scale much longer for m -Mars. And of course that means that the, the truncation conditions will be different for m -Mars. and yet you see the break there, 10 days yeah. for m -Mars. Is there a simple explanation for that? Um, so... You should see a difference. Yeah, I actually expected the same, that I should also see the difference. So I think um, what's interesting is that if you look at the actual uh, measure, the rotation periods of just the n-type stars, so stars of like less than 0.5 Earth masses, for example, they still also peak at around uh, 10 days. And this is like over the course of, uh, you know, like one million year, like Orion, through uh, older clusters like uh, like 10 million years or 30 million years or so, you definitely see some um, like uh, heightened um, number of much faster repeaters, but the actual peak still is at around 10 days. So um, so going back to you know how to get the exact same shape of the fall off, then I think it's a it might be a combination of the of the tidal effect as well. Because uh, what you might expect is the end dwarfs, they, um, they keep their convective, uh, convective uh, interior for longer and also more fully convective. So you might expect a stronger uh, tidal Q parameter there. So it might be sort of a uh, combination of those. Well, we, can, we can talk about that more later. But just if I may ask a, a really quick question. A really quick Very question. fast way. For the super puffs, by how much do you have to deplete the dust? Is it one, two, three orders of magnitude? In order to generate a super Two orders of magnitude. Two orders. Uh, yeah, so a question uh, about, I guess, sort of the selection of. So, so you kind of divided the planet populations, things less than four or three radii, things from four to eight or three radii. So, was it is there was there some motivation to not go to higher radii than that? Um, so they have to actual shooters and, and things that could be more massive. Yeah, so the reason why I did it is because I'm using the late time formation scenario. And if you want to form gas giants, they necessarily form early because you need gas around to form gas-dominated objects. And they probably undergo a different um, formations. They might be more, uh, more amenable to migration, for example.
Yeah, but I have super puffs. <laughs> so it seems like if, if they that perform I mean, much further out than these other small planets, they should have a very different composition, not just in the gas, but what kind of gas they created. So I mean, yeah. is that something you're figuring out? What, what it should be? Yeah, I used to advertise it as like this is one thing that people should look for. Yeah. Like for example, like difference in CO2 ratio. Like the um, uh, the oxygen might be locked in the ISIS, for example. And then I got a lot of resistance <laughs> from people who think a lot about chemistry. Uh, <laughs> um, I, I don't think it's a stupid idea. <laughs> so, yeah, so I think the confusion there is that uh, like some people think about the dredge up from the core and the mixing with the gas, which is like which will definitely happen for gas giants, but like for these super puffs, they actually have a really thick outer radiated layer so that you don't need to worry so much about the mixing with the core. But uh, you know, definitely, uh, I would love for people to actually check, for example, the CO ratio and other chemical compositions uh, with respect to the smaller uh, super Earth systems. Um, so on, on the when you were talking about the super puffs being in resonance, and you showed the distribution of Curie ratios from Kepler, um, there was a significant access uh, just the exterior to resonance. Do you expect that the vast majority of those would be super puffs, or what are your predictions for uh, in situ formation being captured into resonance? Oh, um, so those, those excess speeds, for example, three to two and two to one. Yeah, so the super puffs are really rare population. So those are not super puffs, those are just a typical super earths. Um, so you can actually explain them by um, the planet that was initially like initially in resonance, but like due to due to the secular perturbation, you actually be um, be repulsed out of the resonance. And that's one mechanism to explain this uh, just just sort of like the excess just off the resonance. That's like one of the mechanisms that have been um, um, hypothesized in the community. Well, so if uh, any of you have any more questions, I believe there are maybe two spots still open on your schedule tomorrow. It is fairly full, but I think there are some chance to, to talk to you tomorrow. And otherwise, let's just thank you again. <laughs>